This is going to be a presentation on the genetic component of your IQ score. Um, an IQ score isn't the same thing as intelligence. An IQ score is uh, your performance on a standardized test. And, uh, you know, it, it approximates maybe, it, it, it comes close to trying to get, uh, capture the level of someone's intelligence, but it's, there's a lot of scientific debate about whether it can do that and how close it gets. So that's a separate debate I'm not going to get into. I'm going to get into here um, your IQ score itself, uh, specifically the IQ score between twins, uh, identical twins and non-identical twins, and uh, how those uh, are similar to each other between the two twins. Um, I'll start with a diagram here. Let's see if I can get this here into focus. Okay. I'll explain the diagram first. Uh, up here we have sets of twins. The red ones are both the same color. Those are identical twins. And down here I have green and purple uh, twins that are different colors, and those are non-identical twins. Scientists sometimes call these two monozygotic twins because they came from one zygote, or the combination of one sperm and one egg that split in half and became two people. And then this one with different sperm and egg the non-identical twins are called dizygotic, which means two zygotes, or two sperm-egg combinations. Um, so those are the sets of twins. And then the middle column here says genetics, and underneath it says additive and non-additive, and I'll explain those uh, further into the video. Uh, with, in the case of identical twins, we can assume that they are 100% genetically similar to each other, and in the case of non-identical twins, 50% similar genetically. The third column is the IQ result, your I, the result, results on your IQ score, okay? And down here, when you look at identical twins, when you look at enough of them, say a couple thousand pairs of twins, maybe several thousand pairs of identical twins, what you find is is their scores converge and end up being about 86% similar to each other. So they'll keep taking different twins or the same twins in, in multiple times and no matter how you do it, when you keep studying identical twins, results are close to each other. They're not 100% similar to each other, but they're 86% similar to each other between the two twins. In the case of non-identical twins, when they go through the IQ tests, their results are about 60% similar to each other. Now, if you just look at the genetic part, the similarity between the genetics here, you end up with a 50% difference in genetic similarity between these sets of twins and these sets of twins. When you look at the IQ scores all the way on, on your right, from 86 down to 60, you end up with a 26% difference. So this 50% difference in genetics here, corresponding to this 26% difference in IQ scores here. Now this can lead you to what I call the naive conclusion. It's a knee-jerk kind of conclusion that IQ then must be about 52% genetic and then 48% of your IQ uh, stems from differences in your environment. Uh, the, re the reason this is, is put forward to explain the difference, if you look at something that dr loses 50% of its similarity, or 50% of its effect, and you take 52 as a number, say what would happen if you lost 52% or 50% of that effect? Well, half, it would be half of the effect. Half of 52 is 26. And therefore, if IQ was 52% genetic, it should explain a 26% difference between how similar identical twins are to each other and non-identical twins to each other. And all that might be true if the similarity from in genetic outcomes was the, was a, like a correspondence one to one. Actually, if the non-identical twins were half as similar in genetic outcome, and I'll, I'll say phenotype, 
Um, you get your genotype, which is your the code in your genes, and phenotype is those genes expressed. Okay, but it's not going to be. And we we tend to assume that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. A certain amount, a certain type of gene means a certain expressed expression of the genes. But that's not true because of one of these factors up here. It's called non-additive genetic factors. And this is an example of this would be when there's uh, genetic dominance or allele dominance. Alleles are what we get from our parents um, and they, they, they form they, uh, two, two different alleles come together and that would be that would make up a gene, okay, when, when you get these two alleles. Let's say this was your mother on the side here, this big A and little a, and this is your father over here, big A, little a. Now when they, when we go through sexual reproduction, there's a chance that you'll get from your mother the big A and from your father the big A. In that case, you would be called homozygous dominant, homozygous dominant to two dominant alleles. There's also a chance that say you get the little a from your father and the big A from your mother and then you have this heterozygous situation where you have a dominant allele and a recessive or minor one. In that case the, the big A because it's dominant will kind of drown out the little a's effect. It'll mask the expression of the little a and you'll just get the big A effect when you get this combination. And then here's another case where we had a big and little a down here and one-fourth of the time in this situation you're going to get two little a's, two recessive alleles. So now little a gets expressed and and uh, that's that's how this works. This is called a Punnett square. It's just a picture, it kind of lets you lets you see how how you're going to inherit some phenotypes. You're inheriting genes, but some of the genes are dominant and some of them aren't. And in that case, there some of them are going to get expressed and some of them aren't. And three out of four times here, the dominant one will get expressed. And this one-fourth of the time, the recessive one gets expressed in you. And with the identical twins, what we have is just the process goes through once. A sperm and egg come together, make a zygote, and you have these monozygotic twins that, where the zygote splits into two. So what happens is you get this, whatever result you got in these four combinations will be equally shared, 100% will be equally shared between the two twins. They're getting the same result, it's just one result, shared. But in the case of non-identical twins over here to the right, um, you'll run through the, the process twice, one for each zygote. Remember they're dizygotic twins, meaning two zygotes. So in this green example here, you could get one of these four, and, and then in the purple example is the same, you're going to get one of the four combinations. And let's see if I can get this, I want to get that shadow out of there. Um, Okay. Now, when this when this case with the little the dominant or um, I'm sorry, homozygous recessive condition when this occurs and it matters when it affects intelligence, uh, there's a one in four chance that these identical twins will will get that effect. But when they do, it's 100% shared. In the case where, again, where the little a, little a affects intelligence, there's a one in four chance that the green one, twin will get it, and a one in four chance that the purple twin will get it. But what's the chance that both of them are going to end up with that little a, little a? It is one in 16. If you only have one out of four chance of getting it here, and then you have an independent um, odds again. Well, again, it's one in four only. And the odds that you're going to end up with little a, little a here, and little a, little a here, are only one in 16. 
So here we had one in four chance. That's not good. And here we have a one in 16 chance that both twins are going to get the same IQ affecting result. If in this case where in the cases where recessive this recessive gene, whatever it is, recessive allele, affects intelligence, it's not going to be exactly half of what the identical twins have. It's not going to be, it's not going to go, even though they're only 50% genetically similar, they're not going to get exactly 50% the similarity with respect to the intelligence. It's going to, maybe going to be, they'll share maybe one third the one third the similarity in the cases in the cases if you include cases where these double recessive genes matter okay so it's not straightforward we we're, we can't just start with 52 percent genetic component cut it in half to get 26 because some of the genetic component the non additive genetic factors are are not shared half are not shared at 50 percent rates between the identical and non-identical. The, the, the correspondence, the correlation doesn't drop by 50 percent. drops more like by 60, 65 percent or so. So in those cases, if you include dominance into your plan, the informed conclusion then is that IQ is about 45 percent genetic. 55% due to the environment. Thanks for tuning in.